Okay, here we go. Hello, welcome to the Crowley and Dragas Centre of Attention Sessions. Mark Where we fight Drager. over who has the Centre of Attention for more time, right? Well, I think you've already won, Mr. Man with the Bald Head. <laughs> Woman from your boot, who's calling me from your boudoir? I mean, like, listen. <laughs> Well, this is true. Okay. All right. Even you so far, so call far, by I'm saying, even <laughs> You started the call by saying, I'm calling you from my boudoir. <laughs> so. True. I did. <laughs> I shall laugh, not laugh so much because this is a bouncy surface. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> How are you going? How are I'm you good. going? I'm good. How's isolation treating you? <laughs> uh, great. I mean, yeah, good. I, I'm uh, what what are we on? So today is the last day of April. Is that correct? It's the first day of first May. First of for May you. here. Yes. First yeah. of May. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, so gosh, in another, what, another week and a bit, it'll be two months in isolation. Yeah. I'm flying by. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm great. I'm great. You're good. You're good. You're looking relaxed. It's interesting. I was... I don't think I'd really pegged any kind of time frame to all of this until I, until it got to the end of April. I think it might have been Anzac Day, so that's the 25th of April. And I realised it was... We talked that day. Yeah. And I realised it was a month since I'd last had my inner circle coaching clients here with me and we had to yeah. scrabble to get them back to their place yeah, so of origin. Birthday. My birthday is March 24th. And so yeah. I had my birthday in isolation. And it was, it was one of those things where, you know, we were, yeah. what we, our last day was the 12th. So we were, whatever, not quite two that's weeks. That's right. Ago. Yeah, that's right. You, were, you had then, just started. That's right. We haven't talked. We haven't talked yeah. since that talk, actually. Yeah. yeah. And, then, so and, then, and then suddenly it's the 24th of April. And I'm like, it yeah. has been a month since my birthday. Like, like the first yeah. two weeks took forever. The last month mm. has just flown by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I think what's happened is um, I was reflecting on this this morning. Uh, the last few days, I've actually been on a little bit of a go slow. Uh, and it's not, not actually a go slow. What I've done is the last couple of days, I've actually doubled down on focusing on my kids and spending time with them and, you know, doing baking and you're trying to weave some education into those sessions with them. Because the first three or so weeks of isolation for me were insanely busy. And, mm. um, and I was really conscious of the fact that I was working full time, full time. Um, and my kids' education was like, well, that just has to wait because I just can't not do what I had to be doing at the, at, during those early weeks supporting all these other private practitioner owner, uh, private practice owners. Um, we had so many changes to the rules around our billing processes here in Australia for medical and health professionals. And just trying to coach people through that period of time it was a very, very stressful period for everybody. And I realised this week that has settled down. Now I can spend some time with my kids. And I, I caught myself about five minutes feeling guilty that I wasn't working so hard. And, and realizing, of course, I'm still working hard. I'm just working now as a homeschooling mother. So, you know, I'm changing hats. And uh, so I've actually got, I've got, I don't know if you've seen any of my little animated posts that have popped up. There's only been a couple of them so far. And I've got one that I'm putting up today, which is actually about it's okay to take a rest. Like if you need to take a break, it's actually okay because we're juggling all the things all of the time. Yes. Yeah, so for for those who are achievers, for those who work crazy hard and yeah. are always striving, who feel guilty for taking yeah. a rest, yes, you need to take a rest. Even mm. if you're exercising, the rest days are just as healthy as anything else. So you have yeah. to take a rest. Yeah. But don't you find that most people give themselves too many rests? <laughs> Well, most I don't people know give themselves too people. many free pasts, passes. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about. I don't know. I'm finding um, the people I'm observing, the people I'm interacting with, the people I'm working with, aren't. They're actually doubling down, and mm. I guess that's a reflection of the fact that I'm mostly talking to people in small business or observing, you know, through social media or whatever. People in small business, and I'm seeing how hard. I'm actually seeing how hard they're working. Um, and do most people, I, I, I sometimes wonder about people who, um, well, my husband's a good example, right? So he's lost his job. 
he's found something to do, uh, which is a project of his that he had to shelve for a while. And he's doubling down and spending a lot of time. And so now it's become, well, who's working harder between the two of us kind of thing again. Uh, and of course, trying to juggle the kids as well. So I don't know if people, um, I'm really mindful that in the motivational space, if we want to call it that, there's a bit of a push me, pull you between wanting to nurture and motivate people and wanting to wield a stick and motivate people. And I'm more on the side of nurture. You attract more, is it more flies or more bees with honey than you do? More bees with, with honey than vinegar? Vinegar. Um, I always yeah, get that saying wrong. But I think maybe I'm just a bit more optimistic about human nature. But everyone well, I'm speaking to come, is really busy. I think you come from a people practice. And maybe every, I do. Every person who comes <laughs> from, from a, a people-oriented uh, business is mm. always much more on the nurturing side. Um, well, you know, I, I think also I because... Clear, it's because you're a woman or any of those things. But No. But I think, I think no. that people who are who care about people enough to go into mental health mm. or into any kind of healthcare role or any support role. Anyone mm. who cares about people enough to go into support role will probably be more likely to nurture and then have that mm. little hard edge when they need to, right? Oh, yeah. Whereas yeah, yeah. I, come worry, out with, I come out with the hard edge <laughs> and then when I, I, I realize that I've made someone cry in front of me, I'm like, oh, oh no, uh, it's okay. Don't worry. It's not that bad. <laughs> oh no, I'm an asshole. Hang on a second. I'll just switch hats. Um, exactly. I think, I think um, I was reflecting on the productivity question. How is it possible that I put my phone on do not disturb, but somebody disturbed me? My phone just rang. I don't know how that mm -hmm. was. Um, I was reflecting the other day. I might just check the settings. Hang on. No, still there. Okay. We were talking about productivity and the idea that, you know, before isolation, many businesses were reluctant to allow work from home practices because of concerns around productivity. Now that there's no choice, a lot of businesses are learning that their workers are as productive um, or they're identifying the ones, the staff members mm. that aren't as productive and whether they've got a staffing problem rather than a productivity problem. Some people and I think statistics on yeah out of, out of Europe, where they're looking at power consumption and internet consumption for time of day, <laughs> and what they're able to determine is that yeah. people are sleeping in, they're hustling during the morning, they're mm -hmm. completely taking the afternoons off, mm -hmm. and so there's like this window of like. Yeah, between yeah. like nine thirty and ten and one, people are pretty busy, but yeah, but. Yeah. In general, the statistics show um, that on mass people are. But this pretty, hits the nail like on the head. The afternoons. <laughs> but this takes, hits the nail on the head. Are they still getting the job done? Because I think what we what we're seeing we're seeing that um, you know if people are still getting the job done, but they don't need to do it across the course of eight hours because they're not getting up to go and chat by the water cooler every half an hour because they're bored with being in the office are they still getting the job done, but in a shorter time frame? And that's the question I'm much more interested in because I think that's what's going to influence the future of work and the future of business. If people are finding, or if business owners are finding that people are still getting the job done, you're going to ha then have flow on effects to businesses saying, do I need a bigger footprint mm -hmm. in my own bricks and mortar location? Do I need as high an internet and electricity um, cost or overhead and so on and so on. So like the flow on effects for business See, and how businesses actually operate I, are fascinating tell, to me. I can't tell if you're about to hit what I believe then. Go so on, <laughs> if, if people come into the work and they get the job done, you've hired me for X and I've delivered X and you thought X would take eight or nine hours, but I'm able to get X done in five hours. Most employees go, I got the job done. I go, you have three extra hours you've just created now that have obviously shown flaws in the system. Why don't you do more? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like when computers came along and we had a boom in productivity amongst our economies, it was, it was that, it was that fewer people could do more with less. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we have found that someone can get the job done to what you have hired me for in a smaller amount of time, then I want you to expand the scope of your responsibilities 
or what you can do, or I want to pay you less. Because it, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, you've hired me for this and I've done that. I can do it faster. Why do you care if I'm off riding horses or going for walks? Well, because I've hired you to get the job done. And now that you've proven that you can do it even faster, I want you to do even more. And yeah. this, I yeah. heard this from employees too, where they, say, where they say, I can do the job twice as fast as my colleague. Why are you punishing me for taking the afternoons off? And it's like, well, because you shouldn't take the afternoons off and I'm going to give you a raise and I'm going to make you like, I'm going to pay you more money, like all these other benefits. So mm. keep going, keep pushing, get more done. Let's go. <laughs> what do you okay, say well, to entrepreneurs like me then? <laughs> no, no. Uh, look, I've, I've actually had those conversations with staff in the past where um, productivity has been low and they've been in the office and productivity has been low. And I've had to say to them, you can't expect me to pay you a full-time salary for part-time work. Um, I've definitely had those conversations. My question is then around, you know, hiring for fit for culture rather than skills. That's, I, I, I always come back to that in, um, you know, recruitment advice. You know, hire for fit, for cultural fit uh, and the personality that you want. And I think we'll see more of that. I'm also on the other end of the, the spectrum, you know, really focused on burnout and not wanting people to burn out. So, you know, theoretically, I could have clinicians seeing clients you know, six out of eight hours every day, five days a week. And that's, that's a one way road to burnout for my clinicians. So I dial it back and I average them on about five clients a day. Um, and they have, you know, pockets of downtime. But I think, I think you, we'll see, I think we'll see different extremes start to emerge. And I think we'll see, you know, conscientious, hardworking, motivated, passionate about what they're doing, individuals doing more because they can be more efficient and then we'll see the ones who aren't doing what they're really passionate about what they're enjoying perhaps skiving perhaps doing less or perhaps negotiating their hours down um you know you're just reminding me that the greatest advantage that small business has over big business is their ability to to build culture but but to recruit for people who are ultra passionate mm, because in yeah. big business you will find pockets of you know, ultra passionate people or a really great manager, but it's very hard to replicate across hundreds or thousands of people. Yeah. And so yeah. the, the main advantage that we have as small business people or entrepreneurs is our ability to, to bring on a really tight culture mm. and hire the right yeah. people and toss, toss, you know, like the people who aren't right for culture don't even make it through the door or through the gate. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you're if you're recruiting someone and they're passionate about design, and you know ultimately one day they're probably going to want to go and open their own design agency, but right now they're wanting to learn from you as much as they possibly can, and they're saying, "Give me more, give me more to do." Like I'm loving all of this. Um, that's a very different person, even though you know you're ultimately going to lose them down the track. It's a very different hire than someone who's like, yeah, I think I could do a good job here. I think, you know, I kind of like where you guys are heading, you know, with your agency and uh, I don't know what I want to do in the future. Like yeah, that, 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 that wears thin after about a month of employment when the person's either bored or mm -hmm. they're, um, they're proving themselves to be a really poor fit. For, um, I mean, when people are applying to me, I'm not really interested in their CV as much as I am in what they say in their covering letter, their letter mm -hmm. of introduction. I want to know, I want to know that they understand what my business does. I'll, I want to know that they've actually looked at my website. I want to know that they have seen some of the ah. social media stuff that our, that our practice puts out there. They actually have an, You're an such an old school hiring process. We don't read CVs. Nobody reads we don't, CVs. we don't look at resumes. And we, we don't <laughs> I mean, I do. But... No, no, we don't. We don't. Okay. No cover letters, no resumes. No. What we do so what is do do? In, our, in our post, uh, we have a very transparent, very detailed post that's written um, the way we would write a landing page. So it's written to sell our, the company and the opportunity, what we want to do. And it's very transparent. It's very blunt. Um, mm. And typically in there, we'll have two or three um, questions that are kind of buried in there. And when people apply, we look to make sure that they're in our country or that they're in an address. So we're not getting people to jump through hoops who are in Brazil or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then did they answer the two or three questions that were buried in there? Yeah. And that's it. If they didn't answer the two or three questions that were buried in there, we don't go on. And if they do, then they do go on. 
And the next yeah. step is we, we respond to them with, uh, with three very thoughtful questions that we've designed for the role that will tell us about their seniority, their thinking, their approach, and just mm. the way that they answer, we can learn everything we want to learn about them. And then the next step is a phone interview where they interview us. Mm. They think they're coming in for an interview, but we actually interview them. And, or sorry, we let them interview us. We say, this is your 20 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it is. What do you want to know? And the questions that they ask reveal so much more about them, how prepared they are, mm. what they care about, what they think, mm. what they're worried about. And, and yeah, that all tells us those three hoops we make people jump through. Um, yeah. One, a lot makes sure they're good for culture, helps us understand who they are and where they're going. But the people who make it past those things are so like, are so like hungry to come and work at the company. It's uh, that's the thing, isn't it? Crazy. You know, you know that they've poured over everything. I've done, I've done um, recruitment ads in the past where it's, it's a letter. Basically I've written a letter to my future staff member and um like you have had those embedded questions in there, but generally speaking, it's a, if you don't recognize yourself in this letter, I don't want to hear from you. I'm going to have not said that, but basically the person who's reading this letter is like, Oh my God, she's talking directly to me. How does she know me? You know, like, yes, that, that's built, the reaction I want. We, from we built that a microsite, kind of a, a microsite mm. like that. So there's just mm. like, cause I realized that our, our, our client facing site wasn't doing a good job of explaining where we're going. It's a picture of what we want clients to see, but not not where we're going as a company or culture. So I have like a five page site that's just like one one staff member on my team told me it was a love letter to myself, and I was like, perfect. Then it's doing what I want what I wanted to do, right? I'm, I'm basically <laughs> explaining what we're trying to build here. Yeah, in, you like yeah. it or you don't like it. And that and that's it. You know, that's it. You know, that whole that whole polarizing of the type of person, and I think we're going to see more of more of that. I mean, the people who, there are people who are passionate about what they do who have lost work and they are being incredibly creative about what they're doing next. Uh, there are people who are still in work who or running their own businesses who are being amazingly smart about what they're doing on social media, for example. But I think we'll see a lot of um, conversations that I'm having at the moment are about, well, you know, we never thought we could do X online and we've proven that we can. Like not even can our people be productive, but can our service or whatever it is be done online? Um, I saw an ad for something the other day, which I thought, wow, uh, I think it was an osteopath offering telehealth sessions. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, smart. I'd be, I'm curious to know what they would do in a telehealth session where they're not physically able to do anything touchy touchy yeah so you know i think a lot of businesses a lot of sectors are forced into creativity or bust really that's what it is right now um i'm fascinated and so what, what are you doing then you know you're you know you were able to uh sell your practice uh, unfortunately you were yeah. able to be in Tasmania, but you were able yeah, to do yeah. that now yeah. you're focused on you know you're, you're not doing your um i'm sure you're doing your coaching and stuff but Yep. What do you, yep. what do you do right now besides being well? I split. I split. So I split my practice. Teacher. My practice. My, my practice had two locations. So I sold one, um, and I'm still very connected with the one that I sold, and very very much supporting the woman who's bought that. Um, and so I still have my other practice, which is in Tasmania still, and connecting with my team. I'm noticing that the demand on my time from my practice isn't as much as it was before I sold the other half. Uh, but I'm getting the sense that, that we've got a good sense of unity. Everybody in that team is working from home. So everybody is separate and we've got a, you know, a regular team meeting and the opportunity to touch base with me on as needs basis. And it's so far that seems to be ticking along. Okay. Um, and then the rest of the time is my coaching work. And yeah, supporting my kids. We are not worrying too much about the curriculum that the school is trying in their, you know, I feel like it's a little bit of a, oh, bless their hearts. It's kind of how I feel. Um, you know, it made, I just, this is what happens when you assume, isn't it? I had assumptions that there might be a daily Zoom call with the teacher saying, hi kids, here's what you could do today, blah, blah, blah. Simple, right? Some, Simple. Re some regions have that. I, I yeah. do know that I do know that my uh, wife's family down in Virginia, mm. their school system, the teachers do have 
daily lectures or yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. No, no, nothing that complicated. So there's a list of apps we could have a look at. Uh, there's a list of how many maths problems and <laughs> things we could do each day. Uh, they've just adopted an app called Seesaw where the kids can upload work. But, you know, we've got some homeschooling experience. You don't have Google so we've Classroom? Just reverted. You guys are they're not using Google, Google Classroom. Class, they're not using Google Classroom. Oh, no. okay. Our, our school board, no, our no. school board, <laughs> they start using Google Classroom in grade one. In grade one, the kids are trained. So, um, and in grade seven for us, every oh, school yeah. is handed a Chromebook because the mm. teachers are not allowed to communicate to their kids or even review any work that isn't done through Google Classroom. So, they, so we were able to, so our, our teachers are doing, um, mm. they are doing uh, weekly Zoom calls. So that wouldn't be too much of a transition work. for them then. You know, there wouldn't be too much to, to adapt, too much to shift and change in terms of communication. The workload um, is still very, 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 very low, very low. I mean, our, our, yeah. our mandate is that our students, uh, what is it, 13 and under are supposed to get mm. five hours per week. Five hours per week is the expectation. And then if you're yeah. over that, it's 10 hours per week. So even my, my 13 year old is only expected to do two hours per day of, of work. And do you know what? When, when, you, when, you're in the, when, you're, when you're in a homeschooling model, the expectation is a, is a couple of hours a day, most days, uh, of focused book kind of work. Mm -hmm. The rest of your day it gets taken up with doing things that probably have an educational element to it, to them. You just need to shine the spotlight on the bit that you want well, the kid to remember. You know, this so is, <laughs> this is what I said to, to to my wife, and you know, she's she's been bothered by it, but I'm not a I'm not a I, I don't believe in the the current education system. Like just in terms of the way that, that things most are entrepreneurs taught. don't. No, most entrepreneurs don't. <laughs> but it's not yeah. even that. I just I just you know my son so so since this has been happening we've been working on his bedroom he's going to be moving in this weekend it's projects finally done but you know he spent hours with me insulating and um and running electrical and doing drywall and doing plaster work and paint and all of this stuff to build a room and the conversations we've had you know like the other day my wife said why were you talking to jonah who's um Oh, gosh, let me this right. He's 12, I think. He's 11. <laughs> Born in 08. He's 11. He's going to be 12. Um, she's like, why were you talking about insurance? And I was like, oh, well, it came up because we were talking about cars, and then we were talking about different insurances, and then we got into liability versus this coverage, and then we talked about home and auto and life, and we talked about all the things you could insure and why you would insure it and this and that. I, I, anyway, that's yeah. just a small example, though, of like, you don't, you don't it's need true. It's an education. No. No, and, and no, it's true. It's true. You know, I think that we got, um, I've been doing quite a bit of baking with the kids. It's a fun thing. Oh, Most kids enjoy doing a bit of baking. It's great. There's so many elements to it. You know, yesterday we were making Anzac biscuits and, you know, you've got the butter, melting the butter and you're putting in some golden syrup and then you put in some bicarb soda and you, so you see this chemical reaction take mm -hmm. place and um, we've been making bread and so we've been talking about what does fermentation do and how do you create wild yeast and blah 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 blah, blah and why does the bread rise and all of this stuff but also looking at units of measurement you know getting them to check when they're looking at the, the ingredients list okay make sure you're aware of your unit of measurement so that you're checking on the scales you know that you're measuring the right thing and what's the difference between the units of measurements what are we weighing are we weighing weight or volume blah, blah, blah. and um and then it's the out of the blue conversations like yours with Jonah. They're the ones that floor me. So Henry's eight. And the other morning, first words out of his mouth, um, what are the chances of me getting the coronavirus? He said, I was, oh, I'm pretty slim. What about other kids my age, generally speaking? <laughs> generally speaking. Generally speaking. Um, um, you know, it depends on their circumstances, but you know, they seem to think it's blah, blah, blah. Oh, so we don't have to follow the rules then if we're not going to get the coronavirus. And I said, aha, but then we had a conversation about asymptomatic transmission and how viruses work. <laughs> and, he, and he sort of nodded to him and went, all right, okay, yeah, okay, I'll keep washing my hands then. <laughs> 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 so the conversations you end up having are just gold, you know, not to well, mention the game, you know, board games and all the things that incorporate maths and spelling and everything. We're else. getting into spring and, um, 
the kids are driving us crazy because we have four of them right. and they tend to be loud. Yeah. So yeah. it's nice weather now. So we're sending them outside. We have a trampoline. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, last fall, I pushed it up against part of our yard. And so the other day I was out with the dog and my kids go, hey, watch this. If we climb up the sand pile we have, we can jump onto the fence. We can then walk along the fence for 15 feet and then we can somersault off the fence and land onto the trampoline. And if we do this in the right order, we'll double bounce people off the trampoline. And I'm going, guys, I don't want to go to the hospital right now. We go to break some. Anyway, they're like, we've been doing this for a week, dad. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want you guys to play outside. I want you to have the yeah. child, the type of childhood I had, which was like yeah, yeah. ridiculous. So yeah, I was like, okay, guys, carry on jumping off yeah. the fence onto the trampoline. I think it's crazy. I love but, that. I love that but, they figured it all out. <laughs> and honestly, they wouldn't have done that. Um, they wouldn't have done that last fall. They wouldn't have done it this yeah. spring if they were in yeah. the rhythm of soccer and dance yeah. and school yeah. and games and yeah. all of that other stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Well, we've had, you know, I mean, we've, we've had, um, you know, talk about people pivoting too. You know, we've had Roy's um, acting school had to close down their acting workshops, obviously the face-to-face -face sessions and took them a little while, but they've gotten them up online now. So he's had one so far Zoom session, but out of our conversations with the theatre school, we've now got a private um, acting coach for Roy. And, and our teacher now. Huh? And a guitar okay. teacher? Drumming. Drumming. A drumming teacher for Henry. Um, and what we're noticing now is, you know, there's no reluctance to participate in those things because they're things that they're really interested in, right? Yes. And this is the, this is the beauty of homeschoolers. Homeschoolers know this, that you find what the kid's interested in and that you'll get no argument out of them to do mm -hmm. the stuff. And they just weave in the other things. But also we've got, um, I've noticed, you know, talking about boredom and what it stimulates, in children finding their interests. Roy was in his room the other day teaching himself gar garage band and making some music. Nice. Like, dude, loving this. Nice. So, you know, yeah. we're heading into, we're heading into, well, we're in autumn and so it's raining and miserable and, and we're going to be getting less use out of our park out the back and less opportunities for scootering and all the fun things that we've been doing for exercise. So we're going to have to get a bit creative, but. Yeah, Jonah's been making music here because he, um, I have for my work projects, we mm. have, when we buy stock music, we can often get um, stems. So that's each layer of music broken apart. Mm. So mm. it's just the drums, ah, yeah, just right. the bass line. And then that way we can rebuild the music to whatever length yeah. we want for our commercials yeah. and stuff. So I have all of these stems just in files sitting on there. And Jonah one day was like, oh, that's cool. What is that? And so I just created a folder for him in, in, um, mm -hmm. in Audition, which is the audio software we use. And then I came back like an hour later and he had made like the craziest mix that was so good. And I was like, that is amazing, man. Like, <laughs> come back nice in here. And he's work. learning about time nice and all work. of this stuff. Nice so work. just play is, is what it's about, yeah. right? You know, like, I think the greatest gift that, that I feel, and, and when you ask if I'm doing well, like, I am doing well because um, one, you know, the, I started my business in 2006. So the last recession that, that I lived through clobbered us. It, mm. it almost destroyed us and it was really bad and it was really scary. And for the last four years, I've been waiting for the recession to come. Um, mm. You know, the last year and a half we've, you know, I'm watching the, the, you know, the index curves and it's flipping and we know that a recession is coming, but when will it come? And yet the stocks yeah. keep going higher and yeah. higher. And so, and now that we're here, I don't know what it'll be in six months or nine months or a year. We don't know how long this will last or how bad it will truly be, but um, we're good. Mm. We're good. Like, it's interesting and it's, and it's to me. Now, and it's now it's like, Okay, I I I'm I do not have the fear of recession now. I do not have mm. the fear that I've been carrying for seven years that has probably slowed me down because we're going to shrink, we're going to get smaller. Yeah, uh, let some people go. I may have to let more people go. It may get to the point where it's just me and my family and a business mm. name, and that's yeah, it. Yeah. I have to go out and yeah. get a job, but it's yeah, it's yeah, okay. Yeah. It's okay. Well, I think that's it. You know, I think it's okay. I think that you know, for a lot of people, obviously it's not okay at the moment but like I, like we said you know so many businesses are 
understanding how they can do things differently. I think that ultimately we'll see an opening up of the employment market in a new way, in a different way. Um, I've got capacity to hire somebody in my practice and the thing that's slowing me down is understanding how do I onboard someone remotely? Like how do I, when there's nobody in the office, like normally I would be remote and the office would be full of people. And I'd say, right, off you go. You go and meet and talk and Judy will show you the ropes and Livy will follow you around for a day. You, and, you know, you the know, answer to that, right, is just to do it and figure it out as you go along. Right? That's exactly right. Um, and I am actually talking with, I am actually talking with someone at the moment. So, you know, we will get there. But the, the point being, is that's the, I think that's the one thing that a lot of businesses are struggling with right now is this idea of, well, how do I bring somebody into our systems? How do I, you know, recruit for culture? All of that sort of stuff. We will get past that. You know, there's, there's, um, there's a panic that's happened and that was the panic of, oh, my God, I can't do what I do online. I'm, I'm screwed. And then there was a calm that's happened as people have figured out how to do what they do online. Um, I think I told you the story I'd heard about a plumber who was offering mm -hmm. Zoom consultations, right? Mm -hmm. you know, people are figuring out what they can do more and more online. And we'll see more of that. You know, we'll see more innovation the longer this goes on. Um, I mean, here in Australia, we're starting to talk about loosening restrictions a little. Uh, hasn't happened yet. Uh, I, the last thing they're saying very clearly, the last thing to go will be our closed borders. Obviously, being an island nation, that's our biggest protection. Um, but I know that there's a really close eye being held on the Northern Hemisphere in terms of whether or not there's going to be any second waves of this virus and what there will that be. looks like. And there yeah. will be, there, yeah, there, will, there will be for sure. We, this yeah. is this is the, you know, I, I honestly like I I like change, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I was first really worried about dealing with how life would be like it is now. Yeah, and yeah. Now that I know what life is like, and I can, it's actually and, not that bad. And I like it. I like. I um, <laughs> I, I'm. I feel guilty more often than not for enjoying it so much, but um, yeah. because I know other people are struggling. I know that I know uh, exactly. I know that yeah. there's relationship issues. I know that there's parenting yeah. issues, and they're worried about yeah. employment and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm. I'm having a. I'm having yeah. a really great time of of my new schedule and my new focus yeah, and yeah. and what we're doing. But um, now I'm just worried about what's next because it's yeah. it's. Uh, I, I'm, you, you're always worried well, about you, the you know, next unknown is what does it look like when we go back? <laughs> well, we won't go back. That's the thing. I mean, we'll go back to something different. We'll go forward. We won't go back. We'll go forward. I, I really believe that. I really feel that Dude, the most common I, I don't, conversation. I don't, know. I don't know. Because you go on vacation and you feel like, and then you know when you come back and suddenly you're back into daily life or whatever it is and you're like, was the vacation only three days ago? Somehow, yes, but it wasn't somehow everyone it was... on vacation. It wasn't everyone on vacation for six months. What we've got here is everybody's life has changed and it's changing for long enough for new habits to emerge. You don't go um, on holiday long enough for new habits to emerge. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, once we get past two, three months, it becomes the new normal and how we do work, how we do the things we used to do. I think there'll be some, you know, there'll be a rebound. You know, people go, oh, my God, yay, we can go out for drinks. And then we'll go, I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing that. It will take people a while that, to feel safe. I, I agree. That, I, that's the part mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah, just because mm -hmm. the government says, <laughs> we're back in business, everyone. It's like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go to the movies. Yeah, maybe. I don't know about this yeah, or that. But, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But there's still, um, listen, I, I, I would be perfectly happy. I love the fact that clients for me are much more willing to have these types of conversations because internally we already work remotely a lot of the time anyway. Mm, so the it. fact that a client, that, that I don't have to drive, um, you know, I have to drive 45 minutes, pay for parking, walk, to have a 30 minute meeting, to do the, the, the all to come back, you know, like this yeah, is yeah. great. This is amazing. Yeah. I'm so glad what yeah. will open up for, from a productivity point of view, but yeah. people are going to be, want to be quick. You know, the extroverts of the world will want to get back in the office yeah, yeah. and yeah. go pick up their coffees yeah. and go back to the gym and get their personal trainers mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And, you know, 
the introverts will desperately want to hold on to all of these things that we have now. We're like, remember how great it was when we could do this so and the rest great. of the world will move on. Yeah, yeah, People yeah. Move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. Um, like you, you know, but I'm, I'm obviously, you know, okay with being on social media, but generally speaking, you know, very much an introvert and typically working from home anyway and have experienced homeschooling you know i am one of the most privileged people in this situation because this is like my ongoing normal it means that the rest of the world has slowed down to a pace that makes me feel very secure i worry about obviously people with mental illnesses and you know child abuse and spousal abuse and, and those sorts of things that don't have anybody else with eyes on right now because everyone's at home behind closed doors that's the stuff that worries me um, but I think that I think there's enough of a of a conversation happening about the things that we want to hold on to, and it seems to be a common conversation. I'm really hopeful that it is part of moving I, forward. I mean, so, some we will be able to, some we won't. Like like yeah, one of the of greatest things I cherish right now is that I don't set an alarm, and no one in my family sets an alarm anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was very strict. You know, get up at four forty five every day. Blah blah blah. It's like now. I wake up whenever I wake up and some mornings yeah. it's like five 30. Um, this morning I woke up at five to seven. It was just mm -hmm. whenever I wake up, I wake up yeah, and all my kids, thing, yeah. all my kids are the same way. And so, yeah. you know, my teenage daughter is obviously taking that to extremes <laughs> where it's like 10 30, where it's like yeah. 10 30 or 11. And we're like, you yeah. really have to wake up now. But, yeah, yeah. um, yeah. I, I like, I like that. I like the, just the, mm. the, you know, my wife and I went for a walk this afternoon or this evening after dinner and we were talking about our diets and she's like, I think we're eating healthier than we've ever eaten before because we're doing a one week shop. It's, mm. it's, uh, we, we only eat, like, I didn't even think about this. We only eat whole foods anyway, because we don't yep. eat, we only eat stuff that we make. Um, yep. It's lots and lots of veg, um, you know, healthy fats and all of that stuff. We're both on keto. So it's, it's fairly strict, but we're like, yeah, like, like that yeah. I would love to hold on to, but yeah. when the schedules start up, when the stressors start, when I have a, a bad thing with one client, another thing with another client, because right now all the clients are sleeping, so it's not a big deal. Anyway, like when all those things start to stack up, I, I know these little things that I'm really cherishing right now will fly out the window. Mm -hmm. And, and I, don't, I don't, you know, yes, Evan will say structure Maybe. your life, so that way you can hold on to them. Mm -hmm. But, yep. you know, kids' school starts at 8 a.m. means the kids have to be at school at 8 a.m unless if we're prepared to start homeschooling them, which I would be open to discussing, but I don't think my wife would be because <laughs> they're driving but, her daddy. You know what? I think, I think there, are, there will be an interesting number of families that will say, surprisingly, this has worked okay for us and we can see how our children, well, but we can see how our families are benefiting, benefiting. I think there'll be a number of families saying, we're happier and less stressed than we've ever been and maybe maybe we can decide individually and this is where i think the revolution will come is that not everyone will buy in to the institution you know i think i think that we I won't all go wife, back i asked my wife the, uh, maybe about a week ago if governesses were still a thing could we get a governess to come in because you know in the old the old english yeah. I don't know if it's an australian thing yeah, or not, yeah. but the old english thing yeah yeah if we could hire a private tutor to come in and just homeschool our kids for us if we could afford that that would, that would be the answer. That would be great. Well, you know, and this is what I'm talking about with the guys from the theatre school, right? Mm -hmm. You find the tutor online from anywhere in the world mm -hmm. who meets the interests and the needs of your kids and it's doable. Like it's absolutely doable. A couple of hours a day of formal learning and the rest is of life learning. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I talk about, I often think about kids who've had illness or kids who've had, you know, family crisis to deal with or kids who've travelled or kids who've had parents who weren't on the ball or kids who, blah, 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 blah. Give me any example you like of kids who've had disruptions to their education. I was one of them. Kids who had have disruptions to their education what they choose to do as an adult is still what they choose to do as, a, as an adult. If, if, a, if a kid with a disrupted childhood education is passionate about becoming a doctor, they'll find a way to make that happen. It's got nothing to do with whether or not one, they're sitting in a, in, a, in a seat at 8 a.m. You know, 100%, yeah. You know, like, so here's the funny thing. So when I, when our school system used to have 13 uh, grades, you, you know, you yeah. 
you'd have primary school and then you'd have either a junior high or secondary school. And then at, you know, at the age of 19, so after grade 13, you'd go off to university or college. And so if you were going to college, like a trade or college, you don't, you'd only have to go to grade 12. If you wanted to go to university, you had to take an extra year as a prerequisite to go to university. And so we were of the age when they were eliminating grade 13. Right. And so when I was in grade seven, they said, kids, we're eliminating grade 13. We think you're going to be the year that it's going to happen. So you need to pick right now what you want to be when you grow up, because there's going to be this thing called the double cohort. There's going to be one year where two graduating years will both be competing for the same university spots, the same college spots, the same everything. So grade seven, pick it. Fortunately, it ended up moving back a few years. So it wasn't our year. We were, we, we were, I think, the second or third last grade 13. But my cousin had this happen to him, where in this one year, it was ultra competitive because it was two graduating years in the same year, all going up to the same things. So long story short, my, we have one group of kids who had 13 years of education and another group of kids who had 12 years of education. They are all now 35. Yep. They're, they're all successful or not successful. It literally, makes, but, it literally yeah. makes no you difference. You could them. not tell yeah. which you can't meet someone and say, Oh, you had that extra year of education, yeah, yeah. didn't you? No, and so it. everybody who's worried right now about losing March or May or April or June for us, June is the end of our school year. But even for, for your kid, like mm. kids can lose a year. It's okay. They will grow it's up to be good. Adults. Okay. You know, I was talking to, um, I can't remember now, I was, I've had a couple of conversations, one with the, print, the vice principal and one with one of the teachers at the primary school here. And, and I said, you know, everyone's going to come back and have a completely unique, each child will have a completely unique experience of what this period of time has been like. There's going to be no consistency. And, uh, and, there, and she was saying, yeah, we know, absolutely right. There's going to be no, we can only, and I think the pressure is on the teachers to provide learning materials. That's where their stress is. They've got to provide all this stuff that we're not using, you know, most parents have reached that point where we've gotten over the crest of, Oh my gosh, how am I going to make this work too? I can't make this work. We'll just do the best we can. And we're on that, you know, gent gentler slope now. And, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> going to be so interested to see what the schools make of the kids who come back. They will just pick up, they won't pick up where they left off. They will just pick up and they'll roll with it. You know, listen pretty quickly. You can, you can have each teacher, you know, you have your 22, 28, 30 students in your class. Every kid gets yeah. assessed to where they are at the core yeah. subjects. And, and then they have a modified plan, you know, yeah, and it's, they'll figure it out. They're smart people. They'll figure, it out. they'll figure yeah. it out. Look, you know, I mean, you talk about this thing about disruption to education and not being able to tell who did what, when um, I've talked about, you know, my final year of high school was so disrupted. I ended up with no, I wasn't eligible to go to university when I finished year 12 um, because I didn't have the right year 12 subject to make me eligible. Um, but, you know, you look at me with the PhD now and you think, oh, she obviously went straight through to uni and was the good girl who did all the things. And I wasn't, I did all these other amazing things and I wouldn't trade it. You know, being an actor and being an artist and a photographer and doing all these incredible things. So I think that there's too much weight on kids in particular, especially those teenage kids, um, but also too much weight on parents, you know, buying into, and this is what I mean about people buying into the institution, the institutional belief that this, if we this, don't do this, th something bad's going to happen to my kid. You're hitting on something though that's so ingrained into us that mm. I think that it destroys um, business owners' ability or belief to pivot uh, mm. on the marketing side, on the perception side or what have you. So, so that, that feeling, that thinking that I have to do proper elementary to get to do properly in whatever, secondary, post-secondary school, secondary yeah. school, to go to high school, to get my postgrad, like this yeah. linear thinking to set the story for who you are. Yeah. How many times does an actor or actress work super hard to build a persona? They do something to screw it up. They go into hiding. Three years later, they come out with an apology and a brand new person and everyone goes, 
Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for coming back. Thank you for coming back. Robert Downey Jr. You know, he's the poster boy right. of that sort of stuff. Right. You know? I think, so, I think, but, but you yeah, can do this with yeah, your businesses right. though, right? Like, oh, like cool. you, you go away, you hide a little bit, you figure out who should we be? Who do I want to be? How do I want to be perceived? And then you create that and you come back and suddenly you're the new kid on the block and people are like, amazing. There's this brand new thing that has actually been yeah, yeah, yeah. operating for 12 yeah. years or whatever it is. It's and just, it takes gut to do that yes, right there's a does. there's a restaurant near us near us called Bakash and it's a um and I hadn't really noticed it before um it's one of those sort of restaurants it's got quite a dark interior so if you don't know it's there you don't necessarily notice it when you're walking past and um they've just come into my conscious awareness now again through social media this is a beautiful story right uh, some of the restaurants that have been pivoting really successfully and, you know, incorporating corner store kind of things into their, their, their floor space and doing deliveries, getting their casual staff to do the driving, to do their deliveries for them, having pickup option, cafe option, all sorts of things. Um, one of those restaurants in particular, Entrecote, has been crazy good with their Instagram they're so good and it's through them actually that I found my animator who's, who's working with me now. Um, they did this great post, which is how I heard about Bakash. So they, they did this beautiful post, which just perfectly illustrates everything I'm always on about, about an, an, having an abundance-based mindset, where they celebrated all of their, their restaurant neighbours. They named them all. They had these beautiful photographs. They you know, big, beautiful posts about how amazing all of their neighbours are and how much they value them and how much support they'd been each giving the other. And um, here's what this restaurant's doing. Here's what this one's doing. And here's what this one's doing. And here's what Bakash is doing. So Bakash had just that week reopened uh, to just do fish and chips. Now they're an award-winning seafood restaurant. They probably had to sit with their egos for quite a while before making that decision to just do fish and chips. Because what the, the smart restaurants are noticing, what people need right now is comfort food. They need mm -hmm. the stuff that makes them feel whole and mm -hmm. So they've been really clever and gone, okay, I think we can suck it up and just be a fish and chip shop for a while. And, um, you know, that, that's what you're talking about, you know, that, that courage, the courage to pivot, especially when there's ego involved and perception involved. You know, what am I going to look like? What are people going to think of me? Well, stuff it. We're just happy that you're open. Can I tell you, we'll support you. one of my, I don't know if they're one of my favorite shows, but my favorite entrepreneur mm -hmm. is Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> and yeah. it's not anything that he's done in the last, mm. what is it, 2020 now? Um, so yeah. anything he's done in the last, I'd say, 14 years is not what I'm talking yeah. about. No, not no, no, no. Not the yelling stuff. If you go back, and it's on Amazon Prime, at least it is here in Canada, but if you go back and watch season one, two, three, four of Kitchen Nightmares in the UK. It was amazing. I know I just, exactly I what just you're talking about. I just rewatched them again o over the last week. Mm. Um, twice because yeah. every episode is a different entrepreneur personality. Yeah. You know, this one has too much of an ego. This one yeah. is, is too nice to their staff. This one doesn't spend enough money on, uh, on quality assurance that like mm -hmm. this one is trying to do something that people don't want and not listen to customers. Like every episode is a case study in the entrepreneur. Gordon comes in and does almost the same thing in every single time, which is, which is look for the staff who can cut it, raise the standards, let the people go who can't and simplify, yeah, like just yeah, yeah. simplify the heck simplify out of everything. Right down. And so I've watched That's this twice really in the last important. week and a week and a half oh, because I'm just like, I'm like, I'm getting so inspired yeah, by, yeah, by yeah. the reinvention, by the fact you can save a business by I'm watching these entrepreneurs going, Oh man, I do that. Oh, I should do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm, so I'm listening to Gordon yell at them. <laughs> I love it. I know what, and I know what you're talking about with simplifying, you know, the, the number of restaurants you go into as an example of a small business that does tries to do all things for all people, you know, a restaurant that you go into, that's got a menu that's like 90 pages long. It's like, I just, I can't even look at that. I have to think about what do I feel like eating? And then I'll ask the waiter what I, what I could have that feels like that they, what have they got that feels like what I feel like eating and that overwhelm and too many businesses do that they try to be all things to all people instead of focusing on what they do really well and you know what's their specialty or their niche and just focusing in on that but it also relates to what you're talking about with having to shrink down in times of adversity 
and just reconsolidate, you know, boil, boil it down to its bare bones. And the, the seafood company build back up. Who, who takes all, you know, the seafood restaurant who takes all their pride in yeah. being all fancy and doing all this stuff. Yep. And now during this time has to create chip, fish and chips. There's two ways to look at it, right? The loss yeah. of, yeah. oh, this is so below us. Or they could say, Let's use this opportunity to create the best. You know, it doesn't have to be yeah. greasy. It doesn't have to be garbage. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, like, no. like how can we be the best at this to be known yeah, yeah. for this? Because, because the biggest problem we run into is when we think things are below us, right? You know, yeah, it's just right. like, like That's I shouldn't it. have yeah. to do this or I've worked too hard to still be here or, um, mm -hmm. you know, why doesn't mm -hmm. this happen? Like, like, come on, like yeah. simplify, focus on the things that matter most. Uh, cherish every opportunity and yeah, yeah. you do that and it'll start like it'll start to stack uh, uh, and start to build and grow from there but mm -hmm. but more than anything it's like I've now the reason why I'm not scared uh, now mm -hmm. I, the re yeah, I mean I always have to preface with I don't want anyone to get sick I don't want to lose anyone yeah, yeah, else. Yeah. the reason no, why I'm not, not scared about business is because I take so much comfort in knowing that we can grow and shrink and mm -hmm. focus and reinvent and we can yep. screw up here and then we can come back as something else. Mm -hmm. And as long as I'm still going, as long as the name is there, as long as we have a skill set and we can drive value, there is no end to this. Yeah. Yep. I think you're right. You know, many entrepreneurs struggle to get out of that technician mindset into the business owning mindset. And those of us that are now in the business only, we've always, we can always go back to technician mode. At the end of mm -hmm. the day, I can always go and back and just be a psychologist who sees clients all day, every day. That's, you know, I can, I that's, can go, I can go cut someone's grass. I can exactly. Seven years. exactly. Like, I mean, but everybody could do something, right? Anybody can go and do something. There, there's a need. Um, you know, we had supermarkets, massive recruitment drive for um, delivery drivers. And um, in fact, there was an airline pilot in the news recently, you know, talking about how grateful he was to be able to put food on the table for his family and he's driving deliveries for a supermarket now because obviously that he's been laid off because the airlines are all on the go slow. But I think it is about, it is about challenging ourselves to say, okay, what do I need? How do I meet those needs? Can I meet those needs in my business or do I need to add some other revenue stream or do I need to dial it back a notch so I can meet my meet my consumers or my customers or my clients where they're at. Mm -hmm. So that is about putting your ego in your back pocket. Say, okay, what are the struggles that, yes, we're all in isolation. We all have that struggle. But what does that mean for my actual ideal, my, my general clients or my ideal clients? What does it look like for them specifically? And how can I make sure I'm addressing that with them? through your social media and all the rest of it. I mean, the end, to the, the end of the story with Bakash, I was so impressed by that post um, and so excited by what Bakash had done and understanding, you know, obviously it took a bit of guts to do that. Um, I made damn sure we were there the first night getting fish and chips to bring home. It's so bougie. And You're like... <laughs> <laughs> and um <laughs> oh, you're so in love with the small vendor it's it's I it's so love them i do i do Every, and i was so defensive oh, we're there's all a standing, different we're all standing outside all our social distancing you know standing on our little crosses on the footpath waiting for our order to be called and there was this one lady who was so cross because hers was taking so long and i really wanted to take her aside and give her a good talking to about do you have any idea how difficult it would have been for these guys to reach this point tonight calm down you'll get your fish love it's okay but the staff were a bit stressed and when i went in and collected mine i said how are you going how are you finding it? Did you see it? my post about Starbucks this morning? Or it would have been no. yesterday. No. Oh, I've missed an opportunity to rib you about coffee again. Oh, you have. So, that, that joke is so, my, so right now we only have drive throughs <laughs> open. And yeah, right. this was, this was a, a, a cold brew, dark, uh, mm -hmm. a cold brew, no ice. That's how I drink yeah, it. Yeah, right. Cold brew, black, yeah, yeah. no ice. My wife waited in line for 25 minutes to get a coffee yesterday for herself. And then, and then when I came, when I came upstairs from work, she, uh, it was sitting in the fridge waiting for me. And I was like, Oh my goodness, that's so amazing. It's a treat. But yeah. And she was saying, can you um, imagine anyone willing to wait 25 minutes in line for, her? and, and no. I, no, no one was upset. Okay. No one was upset. No one was angry. No one was upset, but it's just like <laughs> the new world we're in. It's just like, yeah, 
I, I want a coffee from this one place. It's the only place that's open. Uh, you know, I've only had two of these in the last six weeks and I used to drink them all the time. So I'm like, I'm like well, cherishing it. It's like the most amazing. I bought my own. I bought my own. I should send you a photo. I bought my own cold brewing kit. Um, of course you did. Of course I did. Of course I did. Of course I did. You know me now. Um, and it's beautiful. It's this little glass thing. It's only little. It's not one of those great big fancy things. It's just a little glass thing. And then it drips away overnight, you know, and in the morning there you have your very own cold brew and it does all the work for you while you're sleeping. Mark. You need this in your life. You really do. <laughs> I have a son now who uh, has started drinking a little bit of coffee. So when I was growing up as a kid, my, my, I don't know where this came from, but my mom or my aunt or whatever, on special occasions, we'd have cafe au lait, which is like literally just like coffee, milk. Milk. Yeah. Well, the French and version so, is massive, right? The French is, is your aunt French Canadian? No. Uh, we're, we're all German, but but my grandmother's oh. from like the the French border region kind of thing. So a lot of French influence. Mm, yeah. But we always had that. So so I don't know when it was, but maybe a few weeks ago. Um, we, you know, we're very liberal in terms of like we let our kids drink wine already. Even yeah. my thirteen year old, you know, it's like wine and then ginger ale. Um, so there's been a few nights where we've really wanted, like, especially Easter, we really wanted to like, we can't go out, we can't see family, so let's make it special. So my, we got some raspberry wine. And mm. um, anyway, my son now knows that on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, you know, we grind the coffee, we make proper yeah. coffee on the weekends. And so the last few <laughs> weekends I've gotten up and he's already made coffee. He's, he's, mm. he knows, he knows how to grind it. He knows the proportions. He puts the water in, he makes it because he knows yeah. That if he does that, he can have some. <laughs> <laughs> clever kid. Clever, clever yes. kid. Very yes. Very clever kid. It's the same trick well, I used to use for beer yeah. when I was working outside. I'd say, if you go get me a beer, you can have a sip. And then, and then they'd always be very quick to offer. So I don't drink alcohol like that anymore. So that, yeah, that, that's yeah, not yeah. going to work. But, you know. Yeah. Our kids, uh, we will let them have a smell of the wine. And they're just so not. They're not into it. That is just not. They cannot understand what the hell it is we're doing. Um, but what worries me? They know how much I love gin. They know that my drink of choice is a Negroni. Uh, and I often wonder about the conversations that might be had at school about wine, gin, and Negronis. But oh, yeah, it's off gin. It's okay. I haven't oh, had gin. gin in so long. What I'm oh, really Tom missing. Collins. Tom Collins is my drink of choice when yeah, I was doing. Yeah, that's gin. a great summer drink. Beautiful yes. summer drink. Um, the the thing I miss most about Tasmania is the gin culture. There's such a beautiful Tasmania has a lot of wonderful wines and uh, a few excellent whiskies, but gin culture has really taken over. And so there are some beautiful boutique gins coming out of Tasmania, I and I, I miss that. Gins. I haven't had any gin since last May, so it's almost been a year. That's really sad. I haven't had a beer since last May. Yeah, that that I can forgive. I don't, and we're not beer drinkers, so yeah, that okay. means it means yeah. nothing to me. The only the only <laughs> thing that I can have on keto is vodka, and it's not that good, in my opinion. <laughs> can you? Well, I tell you what, we've discovered some um, cocktails. So part of our part of our isolation activities is cocktail hour. Uh, where my husband will create a cocktail. And do you know how how it started? I had this huge bunch of uh, rosemary in the fridge, and mm. I'm thinking it's, there must be so something. so good in gin. Peppercorn, peppercorn, rosemary. Uh, so pink peppercorns, mm. rosemary, mm -hmm. gin. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit of a there's a lemon liqueur that you can get. Mm -hmm. Limoncello, um, and, yeah. And then you do a gin and tonic with rosemary and peppercorn. Oh my goodness, it's so good. So, uh, yeah, I have learnt how to create uh, ro rosemary syrup. So we okay. now have little bottles of rosemary syrup in the fridge. Nice. And uh, my husband's learnt how to make a vodka cocktail called a greyhound. I can't have any sugar. So, so unless you if it's got... Fruit? No. Yeah. So unless oh. if it's club soda. Uh, I mean, I can have some raspberries, a few blueberries. Oh, gee. Okay. Okay. Fine, we can no longer be friends. It's that simple. <laughs> okay. Well, on that we note, I guess, to talk about. <laughs> I guess we'll call it there. We've covered everything, including why we can no longer be friends. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that means we've won. 
I will see you again before. And of course we can still be friends. Um, well, stay well. Stay Thank well. You. Next stay time we talk, weekend. it'll be uh, what, after Mother's Day, before Mother's Day, somewhere around there. And, yes. Uh, and I'm, lo I'm loving the we'll post. We'll find ourselves in the middle of May. We will. I'm loving the posts at the moment on social media saying, attention fathers your children yes. will not be bringing home cute yes. handmade crafts you have yes. 10 days or whatever it is yeah Months i actually have to here. work really hard this year because um mm. our thing here is so we're we're in canada it's you know it's very similar to australia i don't have to probably explain this to you where the dollar no. like depending on what the dollar is yeah, doing yeah, yeah. It affects your imports yep so depending on what our dollar is our stuff goes up and down in cost and it's yeah. it's frankly very expensive compared to america so every spring for the last four years, maybe my wife and her best friend drive down to Pennsylvania. It's a five hour yeah. drive. There's no tax on clothing down there. There's an outlet mall. Everything is extremely cheap. So even with our conversion in dollar, the ladies go away for the weekend. They stay in a hotel, they drink, they eat, they shop for three days straight. And then they can come back with clothing for our family that will last them all the way to the fall. Mm -hmm. that's been mother's day for the last four years, which means I don't have to do anything because they go on a shopping trip. <laughs> There's no shopping trip. Oh dear. There's no shopping uh, trip. There's no going away. There's saying. no staying in a hotel. My wife for a month now has been on edge because she's lost this tremendous thing oh, that she Yeah. Okay. So I have emailed to my husband, the special mother's day hamper email that I received. So I forwarded on to him. Uh, from our favorite French restaurant. There's the Mother's Day meal sorted. You just do that and flowers and I'll be happy. So we'll see what comes. <laughs> I told my wife to start shopping online. So I gave her a budget and I said, you could spend up to this much amount online. That's no good. No, and then I helped her, I helped her, her work something. through, no, no, I helped her work <laughs> through the budget. You know, we determined the number of articles of the different types of clothing she needed and the average cost for them and how many she would want and what would the do tax and everything else. And I said, you can spend up to this much and you can get everything you want. So. And you're going to surprise her with something on the day. Probably. My yeah. wife's love language is gifts and quality yeah. time. Mine's is acts yeah. of service and physical touch. So I'm not so good at actually the gift thing for her because anyone whose love language is gifts gives the most thoughtful things in the world and expects them in return. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Good luck with that one. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, you have yourself an awesome Friday. You too. I'll see you in a fortnight. Take care. Yes. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.